was two nuns wrote a letter to June oh. Faulkner about somebody was complaining in Saskatchewan about the language, you know, right? Because they had some, there was some pretty raw stuff in there. Um, uh, and these nuns had written and said the people in the lobby were bitching about the, the language in it. She said, I lived through it and that's how they talked. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, don't, don't let them say they did. It was good. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't leave it just with Neil Carson had it wrong because, you know, in, in some ways he probably had it right. There was a, 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 a bit of a sea change and, and uh, uh, two or three cast members ended up leaving about six weeks into the show and then um, maybe another four to six weeks after that, there was a, um, uh, George was very unhappy about some things that he overheard us talking about in the dressing room. And he said, right, that's it, we're closing the show. <laughs> that was it, bang, the show was closed. And um, we were absolutely stunned. And a number, you know, we got on the phone to each other. What's going on? Have you heard anything? Whatever. Um, it uh, it fell to uh, another cast member, Ross Skeen, and myself. We um, we gathered all of our courage together, called up George, said we got to come and talk to you. We went over to his house and we sat in his living room with him for three and a half hours, and we told him about uh, the the importance of the show. We told him what was being lost by him just summarily taking it out on, on everybody, what, you know, what he felt about two or three people's attitudes or what they had said or what he interpreted them to say. His attitude generally was, if you're not with me, you're against me. And um, as a result of our meeting with him, uh, I guess a week and a half later, we reopened the show with a couple of new people uh, in the company. Um, and we went on to play for, I guess, another 12 or 14 weeks after that. But what was so interesting, even in the, in the uh, first previews, is that there was a place where you could sneak back from the stage and hear what was going on in the lobby and what people were talking about. And they weren't talking about the costumes. They weren't talking about, isn't so-and-so pretty? There was none of that kind of surface theater talk at all. You could feel that, that it was stirring up all kinds of things. It was making people remember Jesus. That's why my Aunt Maisie did that particular, that the kinds of habits, the kinds of personal uh, ways in which the generation of my parents and how that keeping that extra food all the time in the fridge and never throwing stuff out, all of those kind of reflexes that were totally from that period of time and a period of time in which politically, you know, we have to sort of see that that was a period of time where the United States of America had the most inspired, brilliant leadership that it has ever had in its existence. Hopefully it'll have a glimpse of something like that now, maybe. But in Canada, forget it. You know, there was nothing about assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget yeah. that. That's <laughs> our country to be proud of. But to understand, you know, that what this piece was, was the people talking, and there was no one in the way of that, and the material connected to people in a very visceral, a very emotional way. And to be a part of doing that, uh, I mean, geez, it makes other theater just seem like some jerk-off thing. That you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 really, I never, you know, because the one, the one thing to make clear here about 10 lost years, I just want to establish, is people understand, it wasn't a play. I, we could go in and talk about what it was, but it wasn't a play. It was, anyway. Guess how it should be. Well, yeah, I mean, tagging on to that, I just, this feels like such a, a raw Canadian, for Canadian form that is just, we don't seem to have anymore in our Americanized Canada or whatever. But why do you think that is? Like, what do you think happened that sort of declined that and why yeah. it's not? That's a, ooh, man. I, I can talk. <laughs> That's a big question. That's I a can, big question. Um, George was absolutely furious when Canada Council told him that he had to start pro
very grateful to Canada Council for many things. But um, <laughs> over the years, what has happened is that theatre companies have been um, asked to put forward plans, business plans, visions, structures, da 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 da, and then to fit plays into that, and that, um, uh, and and to guarantee a number of audiences, guarantee how many people are going to come, what are you going to get at box office, business plans, business plans, business plans. Well, let me tell you, you start to get pretty damn scared as an artistic director because that means that if you do a, an experimental piece that you totally believe in, but you're not sure how many people are going to show up, it's going to be called a failure. We lived during a time when that was not, I mean, we worked with George at, at a time when that was not the kind of, Sorry. those weren't the rules. Yeah. And I feel so lucky. Columbus is not a failure. Oh, 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 uh, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> And also because that question of like having to having to plan so far in advance, where you have no chance of, you know, I'm going to send people off to a farm in southwestern Ontario. I'm going to take a book of oral histories. I'm going to go visit a mine. Uh, no. But let me <laughs> say, people can and still do that. Mm -hmm. What's happened, of course, is that over the last 50 years, the percentage of revenue in a theater company that comes from public sources has De diminished incredibly, right? Yeah. So, whereas even today in a place like Germany, a theater company might have 50 to 70 percent of its um, resources coming from arts councils and so on. Uh, it, it, I don't know what it was for TWP, but certainly in the 1970s, 25, 30 percent would not be an unusual figure. Now it's what, 7, uh, 15 maybe on the outside, you know? So, on the one hand, Arts councils have pushed theaters into business models. On the other hand, the theater has become more of an industry. It's more regulated. George operated without a board of directors because he founded TWP and got onto the Canada Council funding before the arts councils were demanding boards of directors be accountable, right? And it was when they forced a board of directors on them that it all went to shit. Um, but, that, you know, that's but the other thing, story. when you, you say you where know. has it gone now, is that, that you guys, because I believe that you young people need to be doing something that is a kind of mixture of what the farm show in 10 last years was, to move around the country, because that stuff that got done in the early 70s, that was uh, a very uh, informative time and creative, explosive time, came from the fact that a whole bunch of people of my age and hippies went from one coast to the other hitchhiking across this country. There was a total blitzkrieg of thousands and thousands of people just heading yeah. out west and going and exploring Canada and kind of becoming passionate about Canada and going to places like, uh, uh, you know, and I think that that, that and it was that stirring around that, that made all that stuff happen in the early 70s. You remind me of, sorry, I'm sorry, but you remind me of, of a show that Factory Theatre uh, produced uh, called Beyond Mozambique. I saw the opening night of Beyond Mozambique, I don't know, I can't remember what year it was, but it was, it was produced again last year, I think, uh, at Factory Theatre. I went back because I, 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 I didn't know what, I, what to expect. I didn't know what I, whether I was going to feel the same sort of thing about the piece. It was a very, a very bizarre, <coughs> interesting, uh, unintelligible uh, play, in, you know, in, in varying parts. I went to see it, and there were a number of actors in it that I knew, and I stayed to see them afterwards, and they said, boy, you were the worst audience we have ever had in the run of this show. And I sort of felt a little bit kind of personally attacked, actually. It was unfair. <laughs> and we didn't get to sort of chat about it. But, the, but what I was doing was sitting, processing how far we've come, uh, remembering the, the milieu of the theater uh, world in Toronto at the time that Beyond Mozambique was originally done. And that's why I ended up being quite quiet, because I wasn't sort of like in a, in a participatory mood, that sort of thing. But Ken Gass, who directed the play originally and directed it again this, this time around in his in his notes, and this is why I'm talking about that, because Cedric has just uh, reminded me, just the, uh, the burst of creativity 
that was happening uh, in, in the, the beginning of the 70s. And what Ken said was it was almost like it wasn't exactly what was being written. It was that things were being written. It was this outpouring of people trying this, trying that, searching around and coming up with, with something, whether there was maybe one minute of real connection with an audience in the, in the entire play. It was important and it was worthwhile having, having done and having got people to come out and sit in a theater and see what they had produced. I mean, we want to see lots of actors on stage again. We just not, aren't seeing enough actors anymore. And, and um, uh, you know, and we want to forget that thrill of like there's a community 